April 22, 1848 at 8 a.m. A clipper ship full of cargo and passengers departed from Calais and crossed the English Channel, breaking through the white fog scattered on the sea level and arriving in the waters near the London dockyard in the early morning. On the watchtower of the dock, the signalman responsible for reporting the entry of ships into the port gave a signal to the moving ships to allow entry, and reported the news of the arrival of ships to the personnel below the observation deck. The London dockyard, which had been silent all night, welcomed it first order of the day. You pigs and trash! If you don't want to be unemployed like other wharves, hurry up for me. At the pier on the shore, the dockers, dressed in shabby and dusty clothes, gathered their tired bodies, who had just transported and sorted the goods, but had no time to rest for a while, and boarded the prepared boats. Although their faces were filled with numbness, their bodies moved involuntarily. Jobs were not easy to find in the 19th century, let alone these special times. If there is a slight error, the only thing waiting for them is unreasonable layoffs. Layoffs are a slow death for a dock worker, who has seen corpses drifting down the Thames in the days since the economic crisis. The roommates who were laughing and laughing together the day before may become a member of the homeless army the next day because they are unemployed and unable to pay the rent. Not to mention them, even those gentlemen who are well dressed on weekdays face the risk of unemployment and even death all the time. These days, they have seen countless corpses floating on the Thames, wearing black jackets with their heads turned to the water and their backs to the sky. Listening to them, these people are those who like to opportunistically on weekdays. It must not be the purest wish of every dock worker to be fired. Under the guidance of the observation deck, the small boats docked on both sides of the London dock slowly entered the narrow distributary channel. The sails were put up one after another, and the boat continued to travel a certain distance with the help of the remaining strength, until the thick iron anchor sank completely under the water. Several small boats gradually approached the cargo ship sailboat, and the wooden inclined ladder fell from the sailboat to the small boat. Under the command of the sailors, the passengers on the plywood slide from the inclined ladder to the dinghy, and then take the dinghy to the shore. The passengers left the ship one by one and boarded the dinghy, until the last young man. At this time, he smiled and shook hands with the sailors who surrounded him in turn. The sailors who were held by the young people were very excited, and they kept chanting words such as Long live the Emperor and Long live the Empire. Cough, cough. A crisp cough came from behind the sailors. Almost all the sailors knew that the owner of the voice was the captain of the ship, and then came the rough voice of the first mate, you have to surround the guests. When? Have you all forgotten your own jobs? Why don't you go to work? The sailors who originally surrounded the young man scattered when they heard Defoco's rough voice, and many sailors had regretful expressions on their faces. The captain and first mate came to the young man and opened their mouths respectfully and said, I'm very sorry for what happened just now. Your Royal Highness. The young man who was called the prince by the captain looked only twenty-three or four years old, with a slender body, a flowing golden head swaying in the wind under the sea breeze, and his face with black pupils and sharp corners resembled that person. Sir. The young man stretched out his hand with a smile and said sincerely, the empire has long ceased to exist for many years, and I am no longer a prince. I prefer you to call me Napoleon Jerome. Bonaparte won. His Royal Highness. The captain held little Jerome's hand like a child seeing a new toy, oh no. Forgive me for calling you Jerome, my father was originally a member of the Imperial Guard, I, I grew up listening to the Emperor's stories as a child. The captain told little Jerome about how his father became a member of the Emperor's army, went through Leipzig with the Emperor, and was forced to retire after the war because of an injury to his right foot. When I learned that you were on the ship, I really didn't know how to face you. My father always taught me. The captain chattered like a flood with a tap turned on, talking about their family's history of fighting for the Emperor. Jerome listened to the captain's words quietly nodding from time to time. The captain's incessant words continued for nearly half an hour, until the first mate who was standing by the side lightly touched his body with his elbow. 
the captain who reacted quickly apologized to Jerome. Jerome nodded and said, Thank you for everything you have done for the Empire. The Bonaparte family will not forget his supporters. After speaking, Jerome took out the pocket watch from his jacket pocket. It was already a quarter past nine. There are less than two hours left until the meeting. I'm sorry. Please allow me to excuse me, I will meet with my cousin. It's not what a gentleman should do to rush to make an appointment. Jerome said apologetically in his tone. No. No. I was abrupt. The captain also apologized. Under the watchful eye of the captain, first mate, and the whole crew, Jerome Bonaparte left the sailboat and jumped into the dinghy leading to the London Pier. Sitting at the stern of the boat, little Jerome looked at the countless boats going back and forth on both sides of the river, with a hint of confusion in his eyes. It has been nearly four months since he travelled to the present, and there is still a layer of estrangement between him and this world. Everything in front of me seems to be so illusory, but it really exists. The water in the Thames is many times dirtier than in the 21st century, and there is an indescribable pungent smell in the air. It's time to let those who advocate fresh air come here to take a look, the pure and fresh air of the 19th century. Little Jerome silently complained in his heart. The boat continued to move forward, and the pungent smell became stronger and stronger. Sitting on the boat and looking far into the distance, you can see rows of towering chimneys emitting white smoke in the distance. This kind of smoke is the sulfur dioxide after burning coal. If it is the 21st century, such emissions will only attract the attention of environmental protection workers and rectification and shutdown are just around the corner. In the 19th century, it was a symbol of the power of an empire. The giant beast called industry is spreading its fierce fangs in an attempt to devour the whole world. Notes, 1. Napoleon. Jerome Bonaparte, September 9, 1822 March 17, 1891, the son of Jerome Bonaparte, Napoleon's nephew. Countless boats and rowboats are used on the narrow inland river, and the boats move forward slowly. Almost every dinghy carried a gentleman in a Rococo period flak dress note one and stockings on his lower body. In the middle is a lady wearing a sun hat and a long lace dress. Playing the Thames is a compulsory course for every British gentleman and lady. Even though the water in the Thames was already turbid and stenched, they were still able to talk about the future without changing their faces. And our protagonist, little Jerome, obviously didn't have the mind to swim in the mountains and waters. Standing on the bow of the boat, he kept looking around the shore with his toes on his toes. Under the superb skills of the sailors, the boat did not collide in the inland river, and gradually approached a small port in the London dockyard. Little Jerome also seemed to have found something on the shore. Little Jerome, who had not waited for the dinghy to dock completely, picked up his luggage and jumped from the dinghy to the shore. Under the amazed eyes of the sailors, Little Jerome smiled and thanked, Thank you for your help during this journey. By the way, say hello to the captain for me. After speaking, Little Jerome turned around and disappeared into the crowd. What an approachable prince, unlike those guys in Paris. I can't wait to turn my nostrils up all day. That's right. If he is elected president, I will definitely vote for him. The prince is elected president? I don't think the authorities will agree to it. Who knows? The sailor's gate docked on the dinghy, waiting Fang Chiu, has the style of a keyboard politician of later generations. Too bad they don't have a keyboard in their hands. Passing through the crowded dockyard, Jerome finally came to a small town near the London dockyard, where he met the person he met. Persily, I'm so glad we can meet again. Little Jerome said after giving the middle-aged man a warm hug with a smile. Count Fischia de Pescari, of course, the identity of the Earl was claimed by Persili, and Little Jerome had reason to suspect that Persili's Earl's identity might be fake, or that it was an Earl in the Italian region. Who does not know that in the whole of Europe, under the leadership of the Holy Pope and the kings of various states in Italy, the titles of titles in Italy have depreciated at a speed visible to the naked eye. In Italy, you only need to occupy any island, 
or even a piece of land in the void, and then hand over a certain amount of money to the Pope or the King of the country, and you can be canonized as a noble, just like the protagonist in the Count of Monte Cristo. Today, not only Italy, but also the aristocracy in the entire European region is depreciating at a speed visible to the naked eye. In France under the rule of the Orleans dynasty, there have been cases of wealthy people being canonized as Viscounts. In the 18th century, this was unimaginable. Capital was eroding the ancient aristocratic system at an unparalleled speed. The glory of the aristocracy gradually became lonely after the war of his uncle. Closer to home, although Pesilli's status as an earl is subject to negotiation, he remains loyal to his cousin, Charles Bonaparte, as a speculator. For a full 13 years from 1835 to the present, the bohemian journalist, also self-proclaimed, contributor to the French Occidental magazine, which stopped after only one issue, is still not a match for the the energy of age and his cousin make all kinds of big news in France. The Strasbourg riot in 1840 was the masterpiece of the Count in front of him. Note to His Royal Highness Jerome, we are also very happy to see you again. But. Perini's expression showed a hint of doubt. If his memory is correct, the last time he met the prince was probably more than a year ago. They, little, Prince Jerome a year ago was definitely not as thin and strong as he is now. A year ago the prince was like a child weighing more than 300 pounds. He was so tired that he was out of breath after just two steps. Well. Little Jerome explained after thinking for a moment, a lot of things happened in the middle, which made me determined to lose weight. Perini showed a clear and wretched expression. Although French women say they have unique tastes, there are few women who are obsessed with fat. Perini also had to admit that, to a certain extent, the thin little Jerome was more suitable as a Bonapartist advocate than Prince Louis, Napoleon Louis. Little Jerome did not know Perini's inner thoughts, but this did not prevent him from guessing that Persili must have arranged him in his mind. Persili, the gentleman standing by the side is the new recruit from my cousin. Little Jerome's voice reached Persili's ear after recovering, person I hurriedly introduced to Jerome, Your Highness. This is Colonel Fleury, who used to serve in the French Foreign Legion. Little Jerome then carefully looked at the sturdy man in front of him. The sharp-edged face revealed the iron blood and murderous aura of a soldier. This is the momentum that can only be felt on the body of a veteran. It is slightly curved. The index finger can see obvious calluses. French Foreign Legion? Very good. Little Jerome nodded with satisfaction and stepped forward to hold Fleury's hand and said, The Bonaparte family needs people like you. It's my honor to be able to serve the Emperor. Colonel Fleury Jerome also claimed to be self-proclaimed if he guessed correctly, or was canonized randomly by his cousin meticulously responded to Little Jerome. Little Jerome let go of Fleury's hand and patted Fleury on the shoulder as a sign of encouragement. Then he turned to look at Persili and asked half-jokingly, Persili, where is Our Majesty now? Does he not want to see my cousin any more? His Royal Highness, His Majesty, he. Pesili drooped his head, looking a little depressed. Thanks for watching, please subscribe. Persili, tell me what happened? Cousin, what happened to him? Pesili's expression caused little Jerome's originally calm heart to waver, and his smiling face gradually turned into a dignified expression. His drooping hands unknowingly caressed his brown-yellow cowhide trousers, and he kept thinking about his past life in his mind. Data of Forgot to mention, the little Jerome in the previous life was a senior European history lover. He was proficient in the history after the Great Revolution. Data, and then forced to cross. For four months, little Jerome did not dare to do anything out of the ordinary. He was afraid that this little butterfly would flap his wings and blow his cousin's throne away, which would be laughable. As long as the cousin becomes the emperor of the empire, he can become a real prince by himself. As for the loss of the throne in the future Franco-Prussian war? Little Jerome wouldn't let it happen at all. No, my cousin shouldn't be in trouble at this time. 
Little Jerome clearly remembers his previous life data, his cousin returned to Paris in April, was then kicked out of the country, and returned to Paris again in July to run for the presidency. The historical line of Louis Bonaparte had a smooth journey to the presidency. Unexpectedly, to be on guard against my own butterfly wings, I still fanned from Paris to London. Your Majesty, he. Pasilli lowered his head and sighed, hesitatingly said, he has cholera, I'm afraid. The word cholera hit Jerome's heart like two heavy hammers, and an indescribable emptiness poured into Jerome's heart, followed by a brief heart palpitation. This feeling comes from the soul acting on Jerome's body, causing his body to lean back slightly, his knees seem to be pulled out of strength, and he falls to the ground. Fortunately, Flary quickly supported Jerome, so Jerome would not lose face. Jerome, who was supported by Flary, roared word by word, Mr. Persilly. You promised me to take care of him dutifully, what the is going on? Why did he get infected with my cousin? Cholera. In the 19th century, when there were no antibiotics, no penicillin, and even medicine was transformed from disorganized to systematic, the most common and deadly thing was cholera. If you have cholera, you have to shed a layer of skin even if you don't die. Feeling Jerome's anger, Pesilli responded cautiously, Your Majesty, he may have contracted it when Britain was acting as a vigilante. Some time ago, Britain was prevalent in that strange disease. Note 1 Vigilante A head of the Bonaparte family, a prince to become a vigilante. Jerome pointed at Pesilli with an angry smile and scolded, What the are you doing? Aunt Audens, father, sister, and others the entire Bonaparte family entrusted you with the leader of the Bonaparte family, and you didn't do anything. If you hadn't instigated your cousin, he wouldn't have gone down this road. The resentment hidden in the depths of the soul was vented through Jerome's mouth, and Pesilli could only submissively express that he had not fulfilled his role as a servant. After some abuse, Jerome asked again, Where is my cousin now? King St. James Street, take care of Miss Howard. Pesilli, who was sullen after being reprimanded by Jerome, quickly responded. Why don't you put? Jerome, who wanted to reprimand Pesilli for not sending his cousin to the hospital, suddenly remembered. In the 19th century, when medical facilities were not perfect, public hospitals and even some private hospitals were not as good as at home. Most doctors in public hospitals were part-time doctors. Earthworkers earn tips. The operating table full of flies, the gauze stained with oil, and the unsterilized scalpel, each of which seems to be a challenge from God to 19th century gentlemen. Compared with dirty hospitals, staying at home is a good choice. Of course, these situations are only for the rich and the workers without money can only enjoy the treatment of the crappy doctors from the street charity hospital. Jerome Bonaparte shouted to Pesilli and Flary, let's go. Under the guidance of Flary, Jerome Bonaparte came to a dark black carriage with a striking Bonaparte logo printed on the side box of the carriage. Obviously, this carriage is not a temporary lease, but is used by my cousin for daily communication. It costs about 2,400 francs to get a good carriage, and about 4,000 francs a year after adding fodder and other miscellaneous items. Jerome decided that his cousin might have used new debts to pay off old debts and used his father's estate as collateral. Jerome opened the car door and got into the carriage of the carriage. Pesilli followed closely. Flary sat in the driver's seat of the carriage, restraining the horse's head with one hand and waving the whip with the other. Sit tight. The carriage began to move under Fleury's skillful technique. Jerome on the carriage closed his eyes and thought about the next road. Pesilli, who was sitting opposite Jerome, looked around anxiously and glanced at Jerome from time to time. The carriage rushed left and right under Fleury's driving, and soon left the slums of East London, crossed Waterloo Bridge and continued to move forward the dividing line of two worlds Shaftbury Street slash St. Martin's Church close at hand. Behind the carriage was a low, dilapidated T-H-R-E-S-D-R-E building, while in front of the carriage was a row of small apartments. Looking to the left in the direction of St. Martin's Church, 
you can even see the towering spire of Buckingham Palace. A church and an iron bridge separate poverty from wealth. After entering Schaffberg Street, the surrounding police force increased significantly. Every 10 meters on the street, vigilantes in tattered uniforms and holding revolvers could be seen patrolling. Even the shops became clean and tidy, and the hustle and bustle of the slums also disappeared. The well-dressed gentlemen also nodded to each other. In order to prevent a collision, Flery slowed down his horse and walked through the streets of Schaffburitz, and stopped at a small mansion at the end of King St. James Street. Your Highness, here we are. Pesilli's voice reached Jerome's ear. Jerome slowly opened his eyes. Thanks for watching, please subscribe. The people inside the mansion seemed to hear the carriage outside the mansion. After a while, a middle-aged man wearing a black flak coat with a white brooch hanging on his chest appeared outside the mansion and nodded slightly to Flary who was sitting in the driver's seat. Flary quickly got out of the driver's seat. He handed the reins of the horse's head to the middle-aged man, and Pasilli in the carriage got up first to open the door and lowered the stairs. Jerome got up and glanced at Pescari who was at the bottom of the stairs and slowly got out of the car, his eyes turned to the middle-aged man holding the horse's head, and his solemn expression forced a smile. Tillin, long time no see. Jerome said in a dry London accent. The middle-aged man named Tai Lan also responded with a smile on his face, His Royal Highness, long time no see. Although he had already learned about his cousin's situation from Pesilli's mouth, Jerome couldn't help but want to ask this servant who had followed his cousin for more than ten years, who was loyal and meticulous in his work. What if it was all just a prank by Pesilli and his cousin? With a faint hope, Jerome asked, Cousin, how is he? How is the situation now? After Talon was silent for a few seconds, he hesitantly responded, Your Majesty, the situation is not optimistic. The body has been feverish, and he is always vomiting. In short, Your Highness, you will know when you go in and take a look. After all, Tyron led the carriage away. He really didn't want to pass on his sadness to Jerome, who had not yet entered the mansion. After listening to Talon's response, Jerome felt another colic in his heart. This pain from the depths of the soul is probably the legacy left by the previous owner of the body. Standing beside Jerome, Pesilli looked at Jerome with a bloodless face, pointed to the small mansion and said, His Royal Highness, Your Majesty is waiting for you in the mansion. Recovering, Jerome walked to the door of the mansion in three steps. Looking at the door of the mansion washed with brown paint in front of him, Jerome didn't have the courage to open the door. Pasili, who was beside him, stretched out his hand and gently pushed the door open. The living room on the first floor appeared in Jerome's eyes. The layout of the living room was roughly the product of the fusion of the Empire period and the Rococo period. The luxurious exterior inadvertently revealed the momentum of a nouveau riche. The red drapery hanging by the window was hooked on the left and right sides of the window with bronze hooks, and the dim, the sun was obscured by the smog of industrialization, the sunlight shone on the fading red Turkish wool blanket, clinging to the the copper-plate railings of the stairs on the first and second floors of the walls are also dazzling in the sunlight. This is an exquisite product for more than 30 years. It has been maintained by the exquisite owner for more than 30 years. Time has not left a scratch on this exquisite product, but it is also like Napoleon's brilliant glory. More than 30 years ago, the fusion product of the imperial regime and the Rococo period was destined to fail to adapt to today's rapidly developing industrialized society. More and more upstarts squeezed into the upper class will determine the direction of the entire era with their strong assets. The extravagance advocated by the aristocracy is no longer and pristine will be popular for a long time. While observing the layout of the mansion, Jerome followed Pesilli's footsteps across the stairs between the first floor and the second floor to the second floor. After passing through the long and narrow corridor on the second floor, Pesilli and Jerome came to the door of a room at the end of the second floor. Cough, cough a violent cough came from the room, and Jerome's mood undoubtedly became worse. Pesilli knocked on the door softly, and a pleasant London accent came from the room, please come in. 
let me come. Just when Persili wanted to push the door and enter, Jerome stopped the Persili soldier and clenched the door handle. There are some things that you still need to face calmly. Jerome took a deep breath and calmed himself down. He pressed the door of the house with one hand, clenched the handle of the door with the other hand, and gently pushed the door open. With the sound of crunch and crunch from the door, everything inside the door entered Jerome's line of sight. A middle-aged man was lying on a gorgeous brown-yellow carved four-corner post bed. He turned his head to the position close to his left hand, and beside his right hand was a handsome man with blonde hair and tearful eyes. The woman, her hand was tightly clasped with the middle-aged man's, and her eyes followed the middle-aged man to the back of the door. Behind the woman was a doctor in a black dress with his back to the door. Seeing his ups and downs, he seemed to be fiddling with something. The middle-aged man who seemed to be dying was the leader of the Bonaparte family, the future Emperor Napoleon III Louis Bonaparte. Sitting next to him is Louis Bonaparte's new love in Britain, Miss Howard, a London lover. Historically, he would return to Paris for elections at the end of April, before entering the presidency in December surrounded by French peasants. In December 1851, he launched a coup and became the consul for life of France. In 1852, he was crowned Emperor of France. Of course Miss Howard would break up with him after he became Emperor. UU reading www.uuganshu.com However, it seems that everything will be a bubble. Louis Bonaparte's face that was getting thinner due to the torment of illness was a little surprised when he looked at Jerome, and then he showed a relieved expression. He stretched out his bony arm and said in a hoarse voice, My cousin, you are finally here. After speaking, the middle-aged man began to cough violently again, his expression gradually becoming painful. All the blonde the side could do was to lightly stroke his back to reduce the middle-aged man's pain. I'm thirsty. I want water, drink water. Louis Bonaparte groaned in pain. His hand kept groping back and forth towards the wardrobe beside the post bed, but he couldn't reach the water glass. Seeing this, Jerome also hurried to Louis Bonaparte to help him get the water glass. At this moment, the unique London accent of the doctor in white coat appeared in the ears of everyone present, if you don't want to be infected, I advise you to stay away from him. Jerome's cholera, which was warned by doctors, was called a Class A infectious disease in later generations. Its infection rate and fatality rate were extremely high, but Jerome did not stop because of the doctor's warning in front of Louis Bonaparte, he held his bony hand in silence. Holding his arm, Napoleon III stopped moaning and looked at his cousin, his dry lips seemed to want to say something. It's all right. Cousin. You will be all right. Jerome, who was holding Louis Bonaparte's palm, could only comfort him as much as possible. Judging from the current situation, his cousin may have passed away. Optimal treatment period. In the later stage of cholera, with systemic organ failure, even the medical system of later generations cannot recover, let alone the current 19th century. Seeing that the patient's family did not follow his suggestions, the doctor silently muttered in his heart, another guy who is not afraid of death. Miss Howard, please move your body a little. I'm going to start treatment. The doctor tried to lower his voice so that his voice was not so rude. Jerome raised his head and noticed the doctor behind Miss Howard. The white doctor's coat had a chubby face, and his whiskers and eagle eyes didn't look like a man walking in a wealthy area. A well-mannered gentleman, rather like a butcher from the slums of London, especially with what looks like a hammer in his hand. Jerome looked up and down at the fat doctor in front of him, with a hint of distrust in his eyes. Are 19th century doctors really not butchers reincarnated? Sir, please don't look at me like this. The fat doctor said to Jerome angrily. This is Dr. James. Miss Howard hurriedly explained to Jerome. He is the most famous doctor in the whole of London. 1. Dr. Fat. No, it should be Dr. James who corrected Miss Howard's mistake, with a happy smile on the corner of his mouth, and said humbly, I am also an academician of the Royal Society of British Medicine. 
invited by Prince Albert to treat the British royal family. Jerome's expression changed slightly. He didn't expect his cousin to hook up with the British royal family in just one year. The royal doctors who treated the British royal family were all guys with eyes above their heads, and the Bonaparte family was just a poor aristocrat with a better name, and its actual assets were not as good as some emerging bankers. Could it be that his cousin really received Albert's gold pounds as rumoured in his previous life? Right now is not the time to ask his cousin if he has hooked up with Queen Victoria. Jerome only hopes that his cousin can escape the disaster safely. The wealth and hope of the Bonaparte family are all pinned on his cousin. Doctor, I... Jerome was about to say something, when Dr. James shook his head and motioned Jerome to speak with his eyes. Jerome slowly let go of Louis Bonaparte, who was losing weight due to illness, and followed Dr. James out to speak. Only Miss Howard and Louis Bonaparte were left with tears in the room. In the corridor, Dr. James lowered his eyebrows and said in a dignified voice, you came just in time. If you come back later, I'm afraid you won't be able to see the patient. Hey! Jerome showed a melancholy expression and asked in a low voice, Doctor, cousin, he is really helpless. Dr. James spread his hands and said, I have extended the patient's life as much as possible. Then, he sighed again and said, It's too late for you to find out. If it had been earlier, I'm afraid there would have been rescue. Britain has not had cholera for more than ten years, and the last cholera was in 1832. More than ten years. Enough time for us to relax. In the 19th century, cholera virus was often confused with enteritis, and many doctors treated cholera as enteritis, so that they missed the best life-saving cycle. Cousin, how long can you last? Jerome asked Dr. James. Even though there were 10,000 reasons in his heart not to believe that his cousin would jump on the street so quickly, Jerome had to accept the fact that his own little butterfly flapped his wings and caused his cousin's death. It may only be three or five days, or maybe a month. The patient's consciousness is getting more and more blurred, and the sweat discharge is getting worse. The head is also hot. Dr. James replied without any fluctuations in his tone, the enema can no longer start any effect, although willow juice can suppress the patient's fever, but this situation may not last for long, that kind of thing is not good for the stomach. Note one willow sap? Aspirin? Jerome's expression was surprised at first, then relieved. Since ancient times, Eastern and Western medicine have used willow bark to boil water to suppress fever. Although they learned that willow bark contains salicylic acid a few years later, it does not hinder their pragmatism. If the fever and dehydration can be suppressed, will the cousin's illness last for a while? The patient sweats too much, and the electrolytes in the body must be out of balance. Jerome muttered to himself, recalling what he had learned in high school. Can Dr. James use the intravenous method to inject saline into the patient's body to replenish the actual fluid in the body? Jerome asked Dr. James. Intravenous injection. Dr. James shook his head and said, This risk is too great. The last time someone had thought of this method for cholera, but only 8 of the 25 cases were cured. There's no other way right now, is there? Jerome said helplessly. Instead of holding on to the shortcomings, it's better to try a new method. No matter how bad it is, there's nowhere to go. That's right. It can't be any worse. Dr. James said, looking up and down Jerome as if he had seen something rare, where did you know about the intravenous infusion method? This method only a few in the medical community know. If you lived in 200 years, you would know it. Jerome responded vaguely. I only learned about it by visiting the French Academy of Sciences by chance. French Academy of Sciences. Dr. James showed a fascinated expression. If the British Royal College of Medicine is the Hall of Glory for doctors in the UK, the French Academy of Sciences is the Hall of Glory for the whole of Europe. Countless ideas burst out from the French Academy of Sciences, and countless ideas came from the French Academy of Sciences. 
What is even more commendable is that the French Academy of Sciences has always been adhering to an inclusive attitude towards everyone. Everyone here means Europeans and a few Russians. The French Academy of Sciences, which is more equal and tolerant than the ANSA. Apart from your daily riots in France, you are not without merits. Dr. James said half jokingly and half seriously. If everyone is satisfied with life, who wants to be a thug? Jerome shrugged and replied, I'm a little envious of Britannia. What do you envy Britain for? Dr. James asked curiously. As a gentleman, he also has a patriotism. I envy you Ansarians for being obedient. Jerome said angrily, if we were in France, London would have no idea how many revolutions there have been. Thanks for watching, please subscribe. Jerome's innuendo embarrassed Dr. James for a few seconds. This revolutionary wind blown by the London Stock Exchange Note 1 did not set off a revolution in its birthplace, but set off a revolution across the English Channel. A massive revolutionary movement, which in turn reacted against Britain, forcing Britain to reform. In order to maintain his last remaining patriotism, Dr. James stubbornly retorted, We ANSA people are a nation with a spirit of contract, and they will definitely not be like those mobs in France. Pft ha ha ha, the spirit of the contract. Jerome couldn't help laughing out loud. This laughter made Dr. James feel annoyed, and he couldn't help but refute, Your Excellency, what's so funny? Jerome restrained his smile and responded with a very crooked expression, Sir, what you call the spirit of the contract is that the factory owner can fire workers freely. Does it represent the spirit of the contract that the poor are free to starve to death? Is the abolition of the poor law also the spirit of the contract? Jerome's barrage of questions made Dr. James speechless. With his petty bourgeois nature, on the one hand, he had a little sympathy for the bottom, but on the other hand, he also hated change. Any change has the potential to bring his class down, and James feels uncomfortable every time he thinks of being in the company of those filthy workers. Not to mention the day and night of the British Kingdom's propaganda to demonize the revolution, making those middle-class people rather choose reform than revolution. After a while, James then retorted, the revolution brings only destruction and chaos. It brings opportunities for the careerists. Your Bonaparte family is the beneficiary of the riot. Of course you spare no effort in propaganda. Revolution. Sir. Facing the issue of Bonaparte's honor, Jerome's expression was extremely solemn, he flicked the dust of his shirt and said in a serious tone, the Bonaparte family has never been the beneficiary of the revolution. Glory never comes from ancient surnames, but from all French people. The Bonaparte family was chosen by the French people to be the spokesperson of the French people. When France does not need Bonaparte, the French people will let France off the stage. Revolutions may bring disorderly riots, but riots will not last long. A new government will appear. Whether it is a republic or an empire, it is just a product to maintain order. Besides, France is not a nation that can only riot, revolutions will always have highs and lows, the Bonaparte family is also not a radical family, we also long for a group. While promoting the theory of his revolutionary conservatives, Jerome carefully observed the expression of Dr. James. At first, Dr. James resisted Jerome's answer. When Jerome talked about maintaining the existing order and system and carrying out appropriate reforms, Dr. James's expression gradually agreed with him. Hope everything goes well. Jerome thought silently in his heart. Okay. Your Excellency, I'm just a doctor, and I'm not interested in political topics. Dr. James said to Jerome against his will. Sorry doctor. Jerome also pretended to be apologetic in response, I always talk about politics when I talk about it. Hey. A glint of light flashed in Dr. James' eyes, and he still asked casually, Your Excellency, I heard that France is holding a general election. I don't know if you will participate. Of course. Jerome nodded without hesitation, and then added, not only me, but the entire Bonaparte family will participate. Do you want to return to France? 
Dr. James's tone was a little hurried. He seemed to be too concerned about the situation of the Bonaparte family. I said that as long as the French people need it, the Bonaparte family can come back to the stage at any time. Jerome responded with a smile. Then, the conversation changed, however, the Bonaparte family is not willing to destroy the order under the existing system. The era of revolution has passed, and the Bonaparte family does not want to undertake the task of destroying Europe. You can't. Dr. James seemed to want to say something, and Jerome immediately interrupted Dr. James and reminded, Doctor, the topic we are discussing has gone beyond the boundary between doctors and family members. I now suspect that what I am facing is not a doctor, but a British bureaucrat. Only then did Dr. James realize that he seemed to have overstepped, he smirked and turned into the room. Jerome, who stayed in place, muttered softly, I don't know if these words will reach Buckingham Palace, it's really exciting. In the room, Dr. James told Louis Bonaparte and Miss Howard about the intravenous injection and the condition of Napoleon III's body. You mean Louis, how long has his body been unable to support him? Although Howard already had boldness in his heart, you you reading www.uugonshu.com but when the doctor handed down the death verdict, she couldn't help crying. Yes. Said Dr. James regretfully, His Excellency the Prince's disease was discovered too late, and now all we can do is prolong the Prince's life as much as possible. Although the intravenous injection method is somewhat dangerous, it may make the Prince you can hold on longer. Risk his life just to make Louis's life last longer. I don't agree. Howard rejected Dr. James' suggestion. Dr. James turned his attention to Jerome. He hoped Jerome could convince Howard. Doctor, I agree with your plan. Louis Bonaparte's weak voice came from the hospital bed. No, Louis is too dangerous. Howard grabbed Louis's hand and responded, I can't lose you. Howard, it's nothing. Napoleon III reassured in a hoarse voice, I have been in a hail of bullets in Italy, and this danger is nothing to me. Note to the terminally ill Louis Bonaparte seemed to have regained his former splendor. An indescribable confidence and calm burst out of his body. At Louis Bonaparte's request, Howard agreed to a plan for intravenous therapy. Thanks for watching, please subscribe R. Due to the constraints of scientific and technological factors in the 19th century, Dr. Jerome and James could not make physiological saline for medical use as in later generations. They could only choose the oldest method to distill 500 ml of water that had been sterilized at high temperature and add evaporated, the well salt crystals that have been concentrated three or four times are mixed according to the ratio of 1 colon 0.009, and a semi-finished physiological saline is produced. Physiological saline was injected intravenously into Louis Bonaparte's body by Dr. James. Louis Bonaparte's severely dehydrated body barely recovered a trace of blood. Your Excellency, drink this. Dr. James brought a bowl of viscous and slightly forgiving liquid to Louis Bonaparte's mouth. The liquid is made from willow bark mixed with something that even Jerome does not know. It is said to have analgesic and gastrointestinal effects. The salicylic acid contained in the juice made from willow bark can relieve Louis. Bonaparte's fever. Louis Bonaparte reluctantly opened his mouth and steaming green juice poured into Louis Bonaparte's mouth. Perhaps because the taste of the juice itself is too anti-human, Louis Bonaparte apparently spit it out the moment he drank it, Dr. James hurriedly took out and twisted the towel placed in the copper warm water basin under the pillar bed. After drying, put it lightly on Louis Bonaparte's mouth to prevent Louis Bonaparte from spitting all over the floor. By reviewing the information about cholera in Britain more than ten years ago, Dr. James can roughly determine that the transmission route of cholera is generally food and water. As long as the transmission route and source of cholera virus are strictly controlled, cholera can be prevented. The way we keep advocating ventilation simply won't work. Louis Bonaparte's Adam's apple slowly wriggled, and he swallowed Dr. James' medicine with difficulty. Dr. James slowly took the towel from Louis Bonaparte's mouth and folded it. After the rectangular towel was folded into the shape of a tofu block by Dr. James, 
Dr. James handed the towel to Jerome and instructed, This towel contaminated with the patient's body fluids, it can no longer be used, burn it. Jerome, who took the towel, nodded. No one understood the dangers of the cholera virus better than him. The reason why the cholera virus occurs in the slums and rarely occurs in the wealthy areas is not only because the poor cannot afford doctors, but also because they do not have a correct understanding of cholera, and they often have intimate relationships with cholera patients after they have cholera. Contact, which will lead to a person contracting cholera, and the whole family will die. The casual burning behavior of Jerome is absolutely unacceptable to the ordinary working class. Those workers who have to wear a pair of trousers together do not have so much money on weekdays, let alone in 1848, when the economic crisis has not recovered. Jerome put the towel that might be contaminated with the cholera virus in the kindling pot next to the fireplace in the living room on the first floor. He held the flint on the fireplace and the kerosene-stained cotton wool in his hand. The flint rubbed against the fireplace to generate the sparks ignited the cotton wool and the flames of the inner blue and outer fire were pinched by Jerome and thrown into the brazier, and the towel in the basin was ignited. With the generation of thick black smoke, a pungent smell of burnt wool poured into Jerome's breath. Seeing this, Persily and Fleury, who were still on the first floor, hurriedly opened the doors and windows to ventilate. After doing all this, Jerome returned to the second floor again, and Persily followed him upstairs. At this time, Dr. James had packed all his things and was ready to leave with a small wooden box. On the occasion of parting, Dr. James did not forget to ask Louis Bonaparte to relax, and at the same time told Jerome and Howard to be careful. Pesilli, help me get a doctor. Louis Bonaparte, who looked a little better than before, said to Pesilli. Respect. Pesilli bowed to Louis Bonaparte. After Dr. James and Persilly left, there were only three people left in the room, Louis Bonaparte, Jerome Bonaparte, and Howard. The scene fell into a dead silence for a while, and after a short silence, Louis Bonaparte, who had recovered a little, said to Howard in a hoarse voice, Dear Howard, can you fulfill one of my requests? Louis, you say it. Howard held Louis Bonaparte's hand and said affectionately, can you please help me buy a newspaper, I haven't reported it for a long time. Louis Bonaparte pleaded to Howard. Louis, I promise you. Howard immediately agreed to Louis Bonaparte's request. Louis Bonaparte smiled, and he named several newspapers in one breath, such as The Times, Polar Star, Rhineland Note 1. Howard wrote down what Louis Bonaparte said about the newspaper and again instructed Louis Bonaparte in the doctor's tone to take care of his illness and leave to help Louis Bonaparte buy the newspaper. Only two cousins, Louis Bonaparte and Jerome Bonaparte, were left in the room. Just when Jerome didn't know how to speak, you you reading www.uuganchu.com Louis Bonaparte's voice reached his ears, Howard is such a smart girl. Hey! Jerome Bonaparte did not understand what Louis Bonaparte meant. My dear cousin, you don't really think I asked her to go out and buy newspapers. Louis Bonaparte said to Jerome with a smile on his hoarse throat. Only then did Jerome react, Cousin, are you trying to get rid of her? That's right. Louis Bonaparte nodded, then sighed, I said Howard is a smart lady. I don't want to be involved in our business. She is always an outsider to the family. Especially after I'm dead. I'm so afraid of her. Cousin, don't worry. The family cannot trouble her. Jerome comforted Louis Bonaparte. I hope I think too much. Louis Bonaparte showed a mocking expression, my uncles, all of them really don't give me peace of mind. Then, he paused and added, of course, except for Uncle Jerome, I am very grateful and miss Uncle Jerome. I think you miss my sister. Jerome silently added in his heart, and said with a respectful face, My father misses you very much too. Of course, and my sister. Matilda, my God. Thanks for watching, please subscribe. Louis Bonaparte, who heard that Mathilde was worried about his safety, was very excited. 
After the excitement, Louis Bonaparte realized that his performance seemed to be too much. After all, Mathilde was already married. She has become a person who has two parallel world lines that do not intersect, not to mention that now he is terminally ill and may face death at any time. After calming down, Louis Bonaparte stammered and asked as if he had entered the sage mode, Your sister, my cousin. How are you doing now? Jerome shook his head and sighed, Since my sister divorced that Russian rich man, she has been wandering around all day. Although she pretended to be indifferent on the surface, I know that the failed marriage was right for you. She hits really hard. Jerome's voice was not very loud, but when it reached Louis Bonaparte's ear, it passed through his eardrum like a bell and hit Louis Bonaparte's brain. Louis Bonaparte's brain went blank. Muttering in a low voice, it's all my fault. If it wasn't me. Mathilde and Louis Bonaparte were childhood cousins. The two loved each other and looked forward to the future. No one in the Bonaparte family believed that their future would become two familiar ones. Stranger When Louis Bonaparte was twenty years old, Louis Bonaparte's mother, the former King of Holland, Queen Audence, and Jerome Bonaparte's father, Jerome the Elder, discussed the engagement of their two children. Mew agreed to the request of Queen Audence, who bought an apartment in Switzerland for her only remaining son, and also gave Louis Bonaparte three million francs in cash and bonds, which means that Louis Bonaparte Bonaparte received an annual annuity of 120,000 francs. In France at that time, a small factory owner worked day and night for only about 20,000 francs a year, and the 120,000 annuity was enough for their young couple to support themselves in Switzerland. It is a pity that the day did not go according to plan. Louis Bonaparte did not follow Audence's arrangement, but insisted on carrying out the second coup d'état, that is, the coup d'état in Strasbourg. Louis Bonaparte was successfully put in prison. This time, the July dynasty was not as easy to talk as the first time. Even if the celebrities in Paris were begging for Bonaparte, Prime Minister Surti still insisted on killing Louis Bonaparte. B.A. was sentenced to life imprisonment. The sentence of life imprisonment made Jerome's sister Mathilde feel the gloom of life. There is a saying that the house leaked and it rained overnight. After hearing that Louis Bonaparte was betrayed and sentenced to life imprisonment, old Jerome's creditors immediately thought that Ordens might not help old Jerome pay off foreign debts as a family member. They came to collect debts one after another. In order to help her father pay off foreign debts, Mathilde could only marry a 26-year-old rich Russian. This marriage only lasted less than five years and was on the verge of breaking up. Mathilde returned from Moscow. Paris, Louis Bonaparte also escaped from prison. No. Jerome spread his hands and sighed, feeling sad for the misfortune of his sister and cousin, this is a tragedy in itself, and we can only blame the merciful God for letting the two truly love each other. People are tormented. Why fate is so incomprehensible as a ruthless female cousin? Why my father owes a huge amount of foreign debt? Louis Bonaparte remained silent, his eyelids drooping slightly. Did he have any resentment against Uncle Jerome, old Jerome, in his heart, but every time he thought of his cousin and cousin's support for him, the resentment in his heart was washed away again. Forget it. Let's not talk about these old sesame and rotten millet things. Louis Bonaparte had already let go of everything, but on this special occasion today, Jerome brought back memories of his old feelings. Well. Stop talking. Jerome decisively cut off the topic. Some things must be stopped when they should be enough. Jerome, my brother. Louis Bonaparte decided to get to the point, he said in a hoarse voice with affection, after my death. Would you like to take over the flag of the Patriarch of the Bonaparte family and continue to fight for it? Fight for the cause of the Bonaparte family. The words of Louis Bonaparte made Jerome's heart beat twice. The banner of the Bonaparte family? What a revolutionary title! Although the Bonaparte family now has only illusory titles and a bunch of illusory honors, these things can help Jerome get what he wants under certain circumstances. In France, Bonaparte has not only represented a person and a family, but also a symbol. 
silver coins with Napoleon's head were circulated into the French countryside. French farmers may not necessarily know who Napoleon was and what he did, but they just need to find the person they are familiar with in the crowd. The nephew of Napoleon Bonaparte, the defender of the peasants, the supporter of the division of fields, these are enough to set off a storm in France. Jerome's wild thoughts made Louis Bonaparte inexplicably flustered. He didn't want to see the title of Patriarch Bonaparte fall on the heads of people other than Jerome Bonaparte, otherwise those people would accuse him. Not sure how he will be programmed after his death. My dear cousin. Louis Bonaparte said eagerly, grabbing Jerome Bonaparte's wrist, although the Bonaparte family has fallen into the dust, I believe that one day the Bonaparte family has fallen. We'll be back on the throne. Yet. Yeah. Jerome nodded without doubt. History has proven the influence of the surname Bonaparte in France. Louis Bonaparte paused and said in a low voice, My cousin, you must know the current situation in France better than I do. Jerome Bonaparte answered gloatingly, The monarch was cast off the throne, the monarch was the orthodox name for Louis Philippe, here is Jerome's nickname for Louis Philippe, the Republic has no place in Paris. Surrounded by trousers, he hurriedly crawled out of the tomb again. It's a pity that there is no second Robespierre, second Danton, second Marat in this crappy republic that has been ripened. They don't even have a second Fouche. There is only one Lamartine who was still composing poetry and music before, an unintimidating mountain party, and a group of remnants standing in the ruins of the dynasty and bunnies returning to Paris from the countryside. How can the Republicans and this group of worms make good politics together? I watch this republic eat jujube pills. Jerome Bonaparte's analysis far exceeded Louis Bonaparte's expectations. He originally just hoped that his cousin could have a little understanding of the current situation in France, and then used the little time left to analyze it for him. As a member of the Bonaparte family not involved in politics is not enough. What he didn't expect was that he never really knew his cousin, and his political sense of smell would be so keen. Louis Bonaparte looked up and down Jerome with scrutiny eyes, his eyes seemed to penetrate Jerome's body and reach the depths of his soul. Jerome straightened his back. Although he was full of self-confidence on the surface, he was also a little uneasy in his heart, for fear that Louis Bonaparte would find out that Jerome was not normal. Who taught you the analysis just now? Louis Bonaparte said again, and Jerome was relieved. Jerome, who adjusted his state a little, pointed at his head and eyes calmly and said, These are all things I saw and thought of myself. No one wants to teach me, besides. Jerome paused, showing a contemptuous smile and said, The city officials note one who are sitting on the top of Paris nine days, I am afraid they are still thinking about how to suppress the next riots. Pack the workers into the national workshop. It's just a delay, it can't solve the unemployment problem in France once and for all let alone those members of parliament who are scheming. Now Paris is like a powder keg. Jerome gestured in the air, it only takes a little spark, and the powder keg will ignite. Paris will then face the second division. At that time, the Republican can only kill the workers. Even if the Republic is lucky suppressing the workers, how can the Republicans achieve universal suffrage as they say? The memory of the citizens of Paris is not like the memory of a fish with only seven seconds. In the original history, a second revolution triggered by the workers will come to Paris in two months. The nascent republic faces a crisis of division or death. Under the hardline policy of the parliament, the moderate Lamartine leaves the stage. Replaced by the military strongman Cavanac, and the republic has been torn apart since then. Jerome Bonaparte's answer made Louis Bonaparte ponder. He didn't expect to be in Paris for a long time, and most of the information he obtained was only from second-hand or even third-hand newspapers, which was far from Jerome's personal the experiencer's dictation is more intuitive. My dear cousin, what do you think of this revolution? Louis Bonaparte asked Jerome Bonaparte with a serious expression. From now on, he no longer regards Jerome Bonaparte as a, a little brother who needs his care, but a flag bearer who is about to raise the Bonaparte flag. An opportunity. Jerome Bonaparte responded without hesitation, and then added, 
an opportunity for the Bonaparte family to return to French politics, the Bonaparte family has not returned to French power for 33 years. Central Paris Jerome raised his hand and clenched his fist, we must seize this opportunity to return to Paris, just like His Majesty the Emperor, if we control Paris, we will control the whole of France. Jerome Bonaparte's ambitious words also aroused Louis Bonaparte's ambition. From 1830 to the present, Louis Bonaparte has never thought of conquering France, but every time it ends in failure. Right now, France's rights are in a vacuum, but her body can't take the lead. Remorse lingered in Louis Bonaparte's heart. The fire of ambition that flickered in his eyes gradually extinguished, leaving only a sigh. After sighing, Louis Bonaparte readjusted his emotions and looked at his cousin Jerome. He didn't have much time, but Jerome is still young, maybe he can. Jerome, what's your plan? Louis Bonaparte folded his hands together and asked with a serious expression. Jerome slowly lowered his arms that were held high in the air, shook his head and said with a wry smile, the original plan was to invite you to return to Paris and then participate in the Paris election. I believe that with Bonaparte's influence in France, it will definitely be able to win the election. Defeat the weak Republicans and seize the throne of France. Can we really seize the rights of France? The two defeats made Louis Bonaparte a little hesitant and confused. He believed that he could seize the rights, but is it too child's play to seize the rights through elections? Even the uncle he advocated was only after he took control of the army and then used public opinion to paint a false democratic coat for his coronation. Whether we can seize power actually depends not on ourselves, but on our opponents. Jerome Bonaparte said confidently, as long as the Republicans continue to implement the universal suffrage system, then the massive rural vote base will be lost. We use it. The French president has it at his fingertips. Louis Bonaparte was also very moved by the scene described by Jerome Bonaparte, but his body no longer allowed him to continue running for elections. Louis Bonaparte turned his attention to Jerome again. This time, his face showed a relieved smile. The mustache on his face stretched out with Louis Bonaparte's smile. He stretched out his hand to hold the heat. Rom Bonaparte's shoulder said, I think your plan should be changed. Change. Jerome Bonaparte instantly understood what he meant, he shook his head and laughed at himself, I'm just an unknown person with some Bonaparte family titles, I'm afraid not many people in Paris can recognize it. Me. Cousin, you are different. The two coups made you famous, the book Eradication of Poverty mixed with Paris, and you have met a erudite Prince Bonaparte. These are all things I did in a short time. It's impossible to have inside. You can too. Louis Bonaparte said firmly and firmly, Trust me, cousin. Sometimes, a dead person is worth more than a living person. Because the dead need to use the mouth of the living to tell their exploits. The living are happy to share the glory of the dead. Especially a dead man who has not made a mistake. Jerome did not understand what Louis Bonaparte meant. I tell you. Louis Bonaparte whispered in Jerome's ear. No. I don't agree. Jerome Bonaparte opened his eyes wide and pursed his lips. Cousin, you must listen to me this time. Louis Bonaparte said to Jerome resolutely, I have a hunch that this is the last chance for the Bonaparte family. If this fails, we may not be able to return to French politics again. Thanks for watching, please subc Riber. The conspiracy between Louis Bonaparte and Jerome Bonaparte is in full swing. A secret meeting is also about to take place at Buckingham Palace in Piccadilly, East London. Buckingham Palace is not far from the residence of Napoleon III in the UK. I am afraid Napoleon himself did not expect that the Bonaparte family and the Hanover family would become neighbours 27 years after his death. A black carriage slowly drove into the trail on the left side of Dicka Geography Street, and the driver stopped the carriage and tapped the box behind him with his fingers and said honestly, Sir, I can only deliver it to you here. After hearing the coachman's response, the person in the box opened the door and lowered the steps to get off. This person was Dr. James from Louis Bonaparte's mansion. 
How much? Dr. James asked the coachman for the price while groping for the few silver coins in his pocket with his head down. Sir, a total of two shillings. Note one the coachman replied softly. Dr. James raised his head and widened his eyes and shouted, What? It costs me two shillings for such a short distance. Is your carriage inlaid with gold? Sir, I'm really sorry. At present, London is still in turmoil, and prices continue to rise, so we have to raise prices to deal with the crisis. I hope you can understand. Understand? I forgive you, who will forgive us? God. It's two shillings for such a short distance, and it's easier for you than robbery. Although the coachman apologized to James, the coachman never gave in on the price. After the scene fell into a temporary stalemate, Dr. James, who was unwilling to delay, was defeated. He scolded and popped out a silver coin with Queen Victoria's head on it and gave it to the coachman. Thank you. Mr. Generosity. The coachman who took the silver coin instantly smiled and thanked Dr. James happily. Go to hell. You are really a bunch of vampires. I swear I'll never be your car again. Dr. James cursed and entered the same lane of Buckingham Palace. The coachman also drove the carriage away. As for the oath to never make a carriage again, it was just a joke to the coachman. How could a decent person like them go out on foot? Across the long and narrow path, it is an open field. The front of the open area is James Park, from which you can see Buckingham Palace in the center of St. James's Park. Dr. James walked on the road leading to Buckingham Palace without craving for the scenery along the way. He soon came to the main gate of Buckingham Palace. This is Buckingham Palace. Do you have any invitations? Two soldiers in bright red military uniforms and high-legged military caps blocked Dr. James' progress and got him. They were the soldiers who were in charge of guarding Buckingham Palace. Right now is a time of turmoil, and they must carefully check everyone who goes to Buckingham Palace. Dr. James slightly adjusted his tie and shirt and said hurriedly, Please let Albert know that Dr. James has important information to report to him. Are you Dr. James? The soldier looked up and down at the unremarkable guy in front of him. I am James, an academician of the Royal Society of Medicine. Dr. James responded proudly with a straight back. Being able to join the Royal Society is something that every scholar is proud of, especially now that the threshold for entering the Royal Society is becoming more and more difficult. Well, royal dating is already on the verge of becoming a gathering place for the elite. Then go in. The soldier rearranged the crossed front-loaded guns, and opened the path that could only accommodate one person. Dr. James finally stepped into the inner courtyard of St. James Park. After a while, a burly man wearing a Scottish kilt appeared. Mr. Brown. Dr. James was a little flattered by the arrival of the strong man, and he hurriedly greeted the strong man in front of him. Born in 1826, John Brown was the son of a Scottish tenant farmer and used to be a groom at Balmoral Castle. When Prince Albert bought the castle, John became Prince Albert's personal servant with great ability and loyalty. After Albert and Victoria married, John Brown, who was 14 years younger, also became the big housekeeper of the Hanover royal family, and the big housekeeper sat for eight years. Even though John Brown looked like he was in his thirties, his actual age was only twenty-two. John Brown, who has been the chief steward of the royal family since the age of twenty-two, said lightly with a characteristic arrogance, Come with me. Prince, I'm talking with the Prime Minister now. Yes. Yes. In the face of the proud royal housekeeper, Dr. James no longer had the pride he had before, and he could only follow John Brown's side obediently. Under the leadership of Dr. James, John Brown came to the main hall of Buckingham Palace. A brown-yellow velvet blanket is laid throughout the hall, every arch is inlaid with golden fringes, a gilded chandelier hangs directly above the living room, and the whole room seems to be enveloped in gold when the sun shines through the window. I'll take you to the lounge first, and I'll call you after the conversation between the prince and the prime minister is over. 
John Brown said to Dr. James in his characteristic Scottish rough tone. Yes. Dr. James hurriedly responded all the way. Under the leadership of John Brown, Dr. James entered a certain room in the side hall through the arch of the main hall. Compared with the splendid main hall, the layout of the side rooms is so simple. A portrait of Victoria and Albert inlaid with gold trim, a sofa with beautifully carved patterns, and oil paintings that cover the entire wall are all in this room. Dr. James was anxiously waiting for the arrival of Prince Albert. After about an hour, a pleasant sound of pushing the door appeared in Dr. James's ear. Dr. James, who had just sat down, hurriedly got up to greet him. I hope I'm not late. Albert said apologetically to Dr. James. No. No. I took the liberty to disturb you. I'm very sorry. James said excitedly looking at the bearded Albert in front of him. Thanks for watching, please subscriber.